All right, Ethan, I'm going to put some names in the chat and you're going to tell me how to pronounce them. Okay. Okay. Simon Destieu. Okay. Okay. How about this one? Strulaholm Ligrid. Ligrid. Okay. I've heard Ligrid. I've heard Ligrid. I've heard Ligrid. Christina Retz. Retsova. Retsova? Retsova? I don't know. Okay, final one. Yeah. This is the final boss. <laughs> I the, I think the last name is Nigmatolina, but I don't know how to say the first name. Uh, Uliana Nigmatolina. I think she was Uliana Kasheva, but she just got married. Welcome back to the Brian and Ethan Biathlon Podcast, where we obviously don't know how to pronounce names. <laughs> but getting a bunch of haters in the chat saying we don't know how to pronounce anything. So there you I go. Know. We did our best. <laughs> we, we tried. The best we can go off of is the British commentator say on Eurovision. <laughs> All right, welcome back to Brian and Ethan's Biathlon Podcast. We are now on Spotify, Google, and Apple, so you can head on over to those apps. Just type in Biathlon, and we're like one of the only Biathlon podcasts on there. Actually, I don't know if you want to type in Biathlon, because then you're going to get all the other competitors for us. So just go Brian and Ethan's Biathlon Podcast. You'll find us. And uh, we also have a, uh, a podcast website, and you can leave us a, a one-minute voice message. So if you you know, want to leave your feedback about what's going on, or, you know, you want to leave us, drop us a line just to say hi, head on over there. You can learn how to leave a, a voice message. And then, uh, you know, if we like what you have to say, maybe we'll include it in a future episode. But uh, let's just dive right into it. Holy smokes. Freaking awesome racing this weekend, Ethan. And uh, let's start with the women's pursuit because Elvira Oiberg, first victory in the books. What did you think? I mean, I couldn't say I didn't see it coming. I think everyone was kind of just waiting for it to happen after how she started the season. But it was, I think the race played out exactly how she needed it to win. I think it came down to her ski speed in the last lap. But her shooting was awesome. Ski speed was super fast. And it was a pretty great race. Yeah, I totally agree. And it, it there's just such this, like, I don't know. It, this, I think there's a common theme over the entire week that there was just a few athletes who were just on. And we'll talk about some of those other athletes a little bit later. But it just seemed like like Oiberg, Elvira Oiberg was not going to not win that race. You know what I mean? It just kind of seemed yeah. like while she was competing, it was just like, it's, this is her race. And everyone else can try, but this is her race. And that, that's mm -hmm. that's pretty crazy considering she has never even won a World Cup race before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I said, like you said, like people were on. And there were definitely some people that were not on <laughs> this week, like Carol Eckhoff, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> but I think it felt like the whole race that Oiberg was going to win. Like after that first lap when she made up so much time on Roisland, I... I it was hard to believe that someone else was going to win that race. Yeah. And I mean, Julia Simone, you have to give a huge shout out to her. I mean, local, you know, it's a local mm -hmm. race The the fans absolutely absurd, like watching all the videos of people, mm -hmm. um, all the world cup people posting on their, on their social media about the fans just going absolutely nuts. Like just crazy, super crazy. Um, she just couldn't couldn't get the job done because Elvira was just on just another planet right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, super, super exciting for um, Elvira to get her first win. And, you know, like you said, I feel like everyone sort of kind of saw it coming a little bit. Um, you know, it's just really a matter mm -hmm. of time before she just, you know, had the right day because she was skiing so freaking fast compared to everyone else. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, no, finally just, it just fell into place, you know, her shooting. Um, she, she felt that her shooting was not a good representation of what she was capable of. And she was able to find, she was finally able to shoot 95% on a day where, um, she had a pretty good start position. So yeah, I mean, just wire to wire, super solid. And, uh, yeah, I mean, nothing more you can say about it. I, what do you think is, is Alvira going to be the, you know, is she going to be the one to beat moving forward? 
I think it's hard to hard to say no to that question. I think she's clearly got the ski speed, and if she can shoot at least one within one shot of the leaders, then she has a chance to win just about any race she enters. And I guess the only reason I ask is because her sister Hanna Oiberg beat out Marta Olsbu mm-hmm. Royce onto the finish line. And if you asked me to put my money down going into that last lap, who was going to win? I put I would have put Roisland just because I feel like she has a lot of fight. And mm-hmm. the fact that Hannah was able to, you know, I, I don't think that Hannah won that competition. I think Roisland lost it a little bit. And so I'm just wondering if mm-hmm. if Hannah or sorry, if if Marta Olsby Roisland is starting to show some cracks in her uh in her armor a little bit, maybe. Is she uh you know, does she show is she showing that maybe she's not as dominant uh as we might have thought in the past? I don't know. I mean she I don't want to say that she, I think she, I agree with you. I think she did lose this race and her missing three targets didn't really help her cause considering everyone else around her had one or two misses in the whole race. But I do think you have to kind of question her tactics a little bit on that last lap when Hannah Oiberg just went right around her going into that last downhill before the uphill into the finish. And I think that's kind of where she lost it. Had she stayed in front and kept, her line and gotten the inside line into the finish, I think she would have won that race. Yeah, and it seemed a little, like, it seemed risky, too, because it seemed like she just went for it off the, you know, line, and there was no strategy of, like, oh, maybe I'll let Hana lead for a little bit, and I'll relax, and then try to get her back. It just seemed like Roisland's plan was just go for it, and Hana was able to just mm-hmm. easily stay right with her and then pass her at the end. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It was it was pretty interesting to see that duel play out the way it did. Um, I kind of expected it to be a little bit more, a little bit more competitive, considering you know both these women are are uh, very high on the overall um, on the overall standings. Uh, you know, Hana being six overall, and Roisland even wearing the yellow bib. It's like it's like I kind of expected them to be a little bit more tactical in there their fight but didn't seem like there was any tactics at all um yeah wondering what your thoughts are on Tira Lekhoff heading home after the sprint even though she had a better sprint than she has had <laughs> um in, in mm-hmm. the, the lead up to the season but it seemed like she just uh yeah seemed like she sort of showed up and I don't, I don't even know why she even went if she was only going to do the sprint and not stay for the pursuit because she qualified for the pursuit, but she just, I don't know, didn't go. Yeah. I, I don't know. I was wondering that when I was looking at the start list and saw that she wasn't starting, but I wonder if she was just kind of not super happy with the way that biathlon was going for her. And maybe after the sprint, she just felt like she needed to start her time off right then and there and that the pursuit maybe wasn't going to be a good thing for her. So I wonder if her decision to go home was kind of like a self-care decision to make sure she's ready to go when the season starts back up again in January. Yeah. I mean, her first her first races in Ostersund were in the high 20s, low 30s. Then they went to Hochfeldsen, and she was, you know, finally kind of came back. Uh, you just sixth place in the sprint, dropped a little bit in the pursuit, and then – another 11th place in the sprint in Anase and uh yeah just decided to head home and it, it almost seemed like there was it wasn't planned it almost seemed like she was going for like the podium or you know if she didn't get the podium she's just heading out and uh mm-hmm. I, I hope she's okay you know I hope she's able to find some respite I know listening to interviews uh with her in the past she's one who is always very um, vocal about, you know, kind of needing that social outlet, that that relaxation away from biathlon or else she'll start going stir crazy. So I wonder if maybe uh, the competition was just getting a little too much for her. Um, she started getting to a bad mental spot and now she's just, you know what, I'm going to go home, enjoy Christmas, make love, as she said <laughs> in an interview last year, and then, uh, you know, just come back ready and stronger than ever. All right, moving on. Miss shot. We're going to have to give it to us on this one, Ethan. We didn't get an episode mm-hmm. out last right, week. So. Mm. Well, it's okay. Yeah. I was traveling for uh, some biathlon competition as I uh, still coach as my day job and 
I know that you are still finishing up college and had maybe some racing of your own going on. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it happens. We still watch Bathon. We still love it. Cut us some slack. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Also, another missed shot for me personally, Johannes Dahle got sent down to the IBU Cup. Oh, my Lord. I am so far (laughs) off with that prediction. It's not even funny. (laughs) If if you gave Brian a bunch of crap for his prediction earlier in the season, you can go ahead and give him some more, considering that Dolly is now back on the IBU Cup. <laughs> hey, <comments>. listen, there's <laughs> still plenty of time. If he comes back after the Christmas break and wins every single race for the remainder of the season, he can still win the overall. So don't count it. Don't count him out yet. And don't call it a comeback. <laughs> All right, let's go back to some of the awesome biathlon racing going on. Um, Probably among the most dominant and professional performances in biathlon history, Emilian Jacqueline Mm -hmm. in the mass start in front of the home crowd. Like, watching that race, I I am so impressed. Mm -hmm. Like, I've been following biathlon my entire life, and I am – I can't express how just absolutely impressed I am with Jacques on that entire race. Crazy. Just absolutely crazy. Yeah. And it was at home, like you mentioned, and you could hear, hear the crowd going crazy. Every shot, every inch on the track, you you can almost feel like the crowd was kind of pushing him along, like right behind him. And that's kind of what gave him the edge. That was an incredible race. Yeah, after the or the post race interview, they asked him, you know, you, you seemed like you were out there in front most of the race because he did. Like the, the whole pack went together in the first loop, and then after that first shooting, he was gone, and he was a solid like mm-hmm. hundred meters, one hundred fifty meters ahead of everyone. And other people shot clean as well, mm-hmm. but he just took off. And they asked him was that the mm-hmm. strategy, and he said, "Yeah." He said he and Quinton Fiume uh, before the start just said, "Are we going for it?" and Jacqueline was just like, hell yeah, we're going for it. <laughs> he went for it. Um, no, but just absolutely incredible. Like, I mean, I, I can't even, like, just the pressure. And it's not the pressure of, you know, people breathing down your neck or the pressure of knowing, oh, if I hit the shot, I'll win. It's the pressure of knowing that every single person was watching you. And all the French athletes made a comment of, like, feeling that that sort of like hush in the air as they came to shoot julia simone even made a comment about it as well and just like knowing i i was nervous i was nervous when i i heard the crowd quiet down and then i'm like oh my god everyone's watching him boom hit boom hit boom hit just absolutely impressive um and then the skiing as well like you know it'd be easy for him to sort of back off on the skiing and then, you know, have the, the crowd catch him or the earth, sorry, the crowd, the pack catch him and uh, overtake him. Mm-hmm. But um, no, just, yeah. Like you said, riding that momentum, riding that wave that the crowd was sort of pushing him around the track. Um, so, so impressive for Jacques. I, we talked about him on our last episode about his tactics and, kind of our thoughts on them and we were both a little a little skeptical on them but his tactic of planning to shoot clean his first shooting and then just go for it and leave everybody behind and just hope to hold on that was pretty impressive because if you look at the shooting scores a lot of people had the same shooting score if not a little better like Felix Leitner in fourth shot clean for the race. Yeah, shout out to Felix. Really good but race for him, too. That was pretty cool. But Tariebo, Christensen, Johannes Kuhn, Benedict Dole, Bakken, Benny Vager, they all had one miss, too, but they were all 10 to 45 seconds back. And I think he made up the, that time right after that first shooting on that second lap. 27 seconds for his first prone clean. And uh, that was, oh, maybe 10th or so. Um, fastest shooting 
And actually, it's kind of funny. Most mm-hmm. people who shot quicker than him also shot clean. So I just don't understand how he got out of the range so fast and how he just broke open mm-hmm. like that. But um, I'm going to have to go back and watch because I, I only watched the race live and then listened to the post-race interview mm-hmm. earlier today. But I'm going to have to go back and watch that race again just to like maybe now with this knowledge of knowing that he sort of was – uh, he wanted to go for it. It's not that she found himself in first place and he was like, I'm just going to keep pushing. It was a strategy. I have to go back now and watch to see him, you know, see if he made that mental switch to just put in a surge right after leaving the range. But um, yeah, it, just absolutely impressive. And then um, let's see, uh, pulling up like, I mean, and shout out to Anton uh, Samolski as well for having uh, two great weekends. Again, we didn't get an episode out last week, but um, had a really good race last weekend. And then again, in the top five um, on a few races this weekend. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about Alan Bakova, and then this year we're talking a lot about uh, Hannah Sola on the women's side. But Belarus has never really had that dude to kind of stand out and, um, yeah, execute some really good races. So, uh, he's only 25 years old, and, and in the last two weekends, he's had his first podium ever in in Hawkfieldson, and now a couple top you know flower ceremonies in uh, in Anasay Le Grand uh, Bernan. Man, it's such a long name. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, shout out to Anton Samolski. What about what about Sebastian Samuelson? The, the first time we ever saw the the red, blue, and yellow bib was Sebastian. Mm-hmm. And then he just quickly lost it. What do you what do you think about Seabass? Is he fading or, or what's happening? I his ski speed doesn't seem to be fading all that much, but he's definitely missing a lot more targets. And I think that's what's costing him. I don't know what it is though. I wonder if it's leaving the comfort of home where they had the first two race weekends in Sweden at home. He knows that range like the back of his hand, that's where they train all summer. And then in Austria, the wheels started to come off a little bit more. And then here in France, we saw that they came off almost completely, just in terms of his relative success. But I don't know. I wonder if he's going to have to think a little long and hard over the Christmas break about what happened so he can fix it before season starts back up. Yeah. And it, what's kind of uh, interesting, let's see here. Um, yeah, so his shooting definitely dropped off in the pursuit, 70%. That was his worst shooting of the season um, so far. I mean, we're only a couple weekends in. But, uh, like, his shooting prior to this weekend was about, oh, 85%. He had a couple hundred percents and then uh, a couple 80%, so maybe about 90%. And then this week he had 80% in the sprint, 70% in the pursuit, and then 80% in the mass start. So, um, yeah, you're right. His shooting was down a little bit. Just trying to pull up to see what his uh, ski his ski times looked like compared to the first couple weekends. Yeah, I mean, he posted, <laughs> he posted his worst ski time of the season in the sprint, but that was the sixth fastest ski time of the race. So... Um, you're right. He's he's skiing the same. It's just that he dropped down a little bit in the shooting department, and uh, yeah, that suffered or it made him made him uh, suffer a little bit. But uh, you know, I, I listened to or I read a an article about this whole Swedish team in general because the question was, are they going to continue their their massive run? And um, I think, as we sort of suspected, the Swedes peaked or they, they scheduled to peak Fort Osterson because it's really important for them to do well at home. Um, and they did, they did extremely well. All the sweet team, all the Swedish athletes did. And now they're going to start to back off a little bit and focus on Beijing. So while they're racing the world cup, they're also going to be apparently focusing on training during their off days and uh, getting the volume back up in preparation for Beijing. So um, the fact that they were able to sort of, you know, put some training back on a training load back on and continue to have decent results. I mean, Sebastian was still doing pretty well <laughs> considering, that, yeah. you know, he was putting the load back on. So, um, 
No, I think Sebastian's going to stay in that fight, and he's going to be in there for a while. Um, what about what about Johannes Tingas Bo? He uh, he he kind of struggled this week. I was kind of expecting him to start making his amazing comeback because we've seen Roislin start to pick it up a little bit. Ekhoff has started to pick it up a little bit. Even Tandervold has started to pick it up. Again, they're not at peak Norwegian form, but they're starting mm-hmm. to get better. Tarja Bo was in the mix this year or this this weekend. But we're still not really seeing Johannes. What do you think about Johannes? Is he going to come back after the break? I think so. I think ski speed wise, he's been competitive within the top 10, but not blowing everyone away like we've seen in previous years. But his shooting has just been letting him down so much this year. And I wonder if. The Norwegians' plan is to peak for the Olympics, and that's why their ski speeds are down a little bit. But if you don't have the shooting figured out, then it's going to be a tough season. But I I think he'll take the break to figure it out and come back and kind of blow us away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. His it's it's funny. He's definitely his ski t- his ski, average skiing uh, rank is definitely down this year. I mean. Last year, lights out, number one all the time. And if he wasn't number one, he was like one, it was like two or three. But this year, it seems like he has, you know, he'll have like a, uh, you know, 10th fastest ski time and then a third fastest and then a 10th and then a sixth fastest. And finally, he had a number one fastest in the, the Hawkfields in pursuit. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, I guess he did. He did win a race <laughs> back in Hawkinson, so yeah. kind of like, oh, you know, is he back now? But then, yeah, he just turned it right around with not a great performance in uh, on a say. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see if he can he can come back to peak Johannes Tico form after the holiday break because um, it, it's it's pretty interesting to see how. His ski ranks, like his ski times, which have been his, yeah, his rock has, has been kind mm-hmm. of letting him down a little bit this year. And then, yeah, he also um, didn't shoot impressively, insanely well in this uh, this week. So um, including 75% in the mass start, which is well below the World Cup average. Um, so... Yeah, I don't know. It's it's super interesting, and all this stuff is kind of, uh, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about this later, but all of this, you know, kind of turnaround with the our top guys, um, you know, maybe not performing as much as or as well as we want them to, and then maybe some people who uh, are dominating on the trails are making for some, some exciting overall action, but we'll talk about that in a second. Let's talk about the women's mass start. I mean – that itself was awesome. Uh, Alvira Oiver, mm-hmm. two in a row, back-to-back win. It, it happens like this. It uh, We saw Lisa Teresa Hauser last year do the exact same thing where she sort of burst onto the podium and then boom, 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 just kept backing it up with podium results and wins. So, um, yeah, Alvira Oiberg, another win, another day. <laughs> mm-hmm. And... <laughs> Yeah, just another another awesome awesome race by the Swede, and then uh, even unfortunately Julia Simone just again could not get ahead, just could not get ahead of her mm-hmm. uh, her rival there in front of the home crowd. <laughs> yeah, and you know, in biathlon the saying is if you're gonna miss, miss early, and that's what exactly what Elvira Oiberg did. I mean, she missed one in both her prone shootings, but then cleaned the two standing shootings and. If you look down the list, the rest of the podium members both missed one and both standing shootings. And I think that's kind of what gave her the edge was that the other two athletes that were on the podium kept going in the penalty loop towards the end of the race, and Weiberg could just go right back out on course, and her legs were fresher towards the end of the race, and her ski speed is just untouchable right now too which certainly doesn't hurt her yeah absolutely um also doro suddenly out of nowhere doro 
mm-hmm. like in the fight. I think she was even leading the race for a good bit of it. Um, that was mm-hmm. definitely good to see her back up there um, and uh, fighting for the top spots because we haven't really seen much of Doro this year. We, and we haven't really talked about her really at all either. What do you think about Doro? Is she just kind mm-hmm. of saving it up for the Olympics or is she past her prime? I think she's peaking for the Olympics. I mean, she's every weekend it seems like she's gone a little better, slowly but surely. And then here she is in the flower ceremony with fourth place. And had she cleaned that last standing and not had a miss, I think she probably would have won this race. So with one miss in the last standing, she was still only 13 seconds back on Hoiberg, who did did take her time going through the finish stretch, but I think she would have been able to hold on if it was tw- over just over 20 seconds leaving the range. Yeah. And I think I think she's going to have a good Olympics and good end of the year. Okay, I, I, a lot of people in the comments section on some of my past videos have been saying that they think Doro's past her prime, and um, I mean, I was honestly beginning to agree with them. Starting off the season in the 30, like 37th in the individual. Um, shooting 80 percent not great for an individual but then um yeah kind of leveling out in like the teens uh with a 33rd in the sprint and hawkfieldson just yeah not not prime doro fashion so it's kind of crazy to see her come out of nowhere and just be like 19th in the sprint and honestly moves up to 10th and then all of a sudden fourth in the mass start shooting 95 percent her best shooting of the season so far um, with a 15th ski rank, which is one of her best ski ranks of the season this, this year. So um, yeah, we haven't talked much about Doro just because she hasn't really, I don't know, been that exciting. Um, it's not, she hasn't been overly bad like Tyrolekov has been, <laughs> um, but she hasn't been uh, overly successful either. So she's just kind of caught in that middle ground of, you know, people who are just like, yeah, they're out there. Um, mm-hmm. but then what about um, I mean what like someone we haven't talked about is this uh, Christina Redzova from from Russia like rising in the ranks pretty quickly um, you know I, mm-hmm. I gotta pull up some stats on her from Real Biathlon to see what her situation is but she's currently ranked ninth overall and had some really good races this weekend not too much uh, background on the World Cup. Um, really, only has data going back to you know last year. But uh, her her shooting is way up this year. Her skiing is way up this year, and she's been posting some really good um, some really good races. Has four top ten results this year so far. Uh, where look, last year she was kind of averaging like in the forties. So. Um, mm-hmm. sort of a, a breakthrough season for Christina here. Um, is there anything else that uh, you've been able to dig up about her in the stats? Nothing really. I mean, like you said, she doesn't have a ton of experience and time on the World Cup, but it's always super impressive when someone kind of breaks through and has those really good few races kind of early on in their World Cup career, and some of them are able to keep it going and hold on and some of them aren't and hopefully she's able to and she's definitely shown that she can compete with the rest of them both on the skis and on the range and if she keeps it together for the rest of the season i don't see why she won't be able to keep climbing the overall standings yeah on the ibu cup she's been really consistent over the last like honestly three years actually consistently posting top 10 ski times but the thing that's been holding her back on the ibu cup was her shooting uh, in specifically her standing shooting in 2018. Oh my gosh. In 2018, her standing average was 58%, which is not good. <laughs> that is just, yeah, that's just hands down. Not good. Uh, making her season average 68%. And then last year she was able to, bu- to bump up both her prone and her standing. It looks like she didn't do as many races cause she was probably in the world cup more, but she was able to bump up both to 85%. And then actually get you know a season on the World Cup, um, where she was able to shoot about eighty to you know eighty five percent during the World Cup season. So um, you know it looks like her shooting is on the rise, 
Her IBU results suggest that her skiing has been consistently one of the faster skiers on the IBU Cup. And as we know from like people like Stina Nielsen and some of these others who are going back and forth between the IBU Cup a little bit this year, the IBU Cup is no joke. And if she can post pretty decent ski times on the IBU Cup and she can improve her shooting a little bit better, I bet we'll see Christina Ritzova on the... Uh, on the World Cup top 10 uh, more frequently as we move towards Beijing. Okay, men's yellow bib. We are now setting records for the people to hold yellow bibs. We had Fionn Maie, so Christensen, I, let me go back. We had Christensen wear the yellow bib in, in Hockfeldsen, which he quickly relinquished. Phil Maillet was able to put the yellow bib on for the mass start in uh, La Grande Bernard. So uh, that was really exciting to see a French dude with the yellow bib in front of the home crowd. And now with his absolutely dominant performance, I can't say enough about how dominant this is, his performance was in the mass start. The dominant performance of Emilien Jacqueline in the mass start has now earned him the yellow bib. And he is going to be our seventh male to wear the yellow bib and we are done with the first trimester the first trimester it's it's nuts and all these guys are so close i mean there's seven people seven people above 300 points tarye Bo, or sorry johannes tingis bow is 310 points that's 61 points back of jacqueline that's literally one win one win away mm-hmm. from gaining all those points back obviously yeah Jacqueline will probably earn some points to try to keep the lead and you know stay ahead but I mean it's so close even within the top five and top six that if any of these guys has a bad race you know they like in a bad race turns into like 10th place at this point like if you're in 10th place that's a bad race because mm-hmm. <laughs> it's so close right yeah. now um is this heating up to be the most competitive season we've ever seen for the men? Or do you think it's going to start to level out? I think it's going to stay competitive. I mean, the top seven guys in the overall seem to be the ones who are constantly making up the top ten and throw in a few different names every week. Like Small Ski this week and last week has himself an eighth in the overall standing. But I think these top seven guys are going to be – battling it out for the overall all season long. I, I agree. I mean, yeah, someone who we haven't even talked about is uh, Edward Latyapov. Um, that was a steal on my, uh, my fantasy team. He's keeping the team going strong <laughs> now that Sebastian has cooled <laughs> off a little bit. But Edward Latyapov currently sitting in fifth place. Uh, the Bow brothers, you know that Johannes Tingis is going to um, – you know that Johannes Tingis is probably going to come back and, and stay strong. Tarja is going to stay strong. There's a little bit of a gap to Simulski and to Stuo and then, you know, to the rest of the field being Kuhn, Loganov, Cloud, Bakken. But, oh, my gosh, like, yeah, seven people up here. I, I don't think we've seen, like, a, a breakaway like this in a while. Um, it's usually just Bo and Forcad, or last year it was Bo and Lagrid. Uh, but – Oh my gosh, just having all these guys together is super fun, super exciting, and super great for the sport too. I mean, it's uh, mm-hmm. we're going to see what happens. And I mean, I still think Ponsaloma is underperforming. I'd love to see him get up there. Who knows what place he's in, like the 20s or something. Um, <laughs> uh, and then there's like uh, even Loganov. Like I don't want to – I don't want to support Loganov, but I think he's going to, I think he's going to pick it up as well. I think he's going to become a a regular top 10 guy like he usually is. So um, yeah, just there's another couple guys there that are going to, that are going to come back up and, and try to fight as well. Um, But yeah. And then on the women's side, Roisland's kind of pulling away a little bit from Oiberg, but uh, Elvira is, you know, obviously those last two wins to finish out the trimester really helped the cause kind of narrowed that gap a little bit. Alan back of us started flatlining a little bit, but we saw that last year from her. So hopefully she can um, stay strong through the year. And then yeah, Hauser and Hannah Oiberg um, there's, there's your top five right there. And then there's a really big gap 
till Biscon, Brizza, and um, Herman. But uh, I mean, both yeah, both scenes are really fun, really competitive, and we still haven't even seen Turlakov mm-hmm. out there. Um, yeah, it's gonna be crazy. <laughs> it almost seems like you can see the yellow bib changing from person to person every race. Yeah. At least on the men's side, which is kind of cool to see, but the pressure these guys must be on knowing that mi- missing one or two shots can take that away from them has got to be kind of crazy. I know, right? Like, that's the crazy thing is you're literally one shot away. Like, one hit, you know, one missed shot could take that yellow bib away from you, or one extra hit could earn you that yellow bib for the next race. And that's super exciting. Mm-hmm. All right, let's do our spare round. I mean, first trimester's over. We've had four weekends of racing going into the holiday break. Spare round. Who is going to win the overall Crystal Globe at this point? Like, who who is your prediction? Let's go men first. Men first. I'm going to stick with Johannes Tungisbo. I chose him at the beginning of the season. I'm going to stick with him throughout the whole season. And then on the women's side... I think, I think Roisland is gonna gonna keep it for the rest of the year. Maybe Elvira Oyberg will wear it one or two times, but I don't know. If she quite has the consistency on the World Cup to continuously post top top three results. So I'm gonna go with Johannes Tengis and Roisland for my two overall winners. Okay, I'm gonna go with Quinton Filmaye because. He just seems really consistent. I was a little nervous about the start to his season, but he's immediately snapped back. And then for the women, I mean, Roisland's got a big lead right now. And then we got Hauser, Hannah Oiberg. Honestly, I'm going to go Hannah Oiberg. I know she's like fifth in that, you know, group of five girls, but uh, Mm -hmm. she's just going to be, I don't know, more consistent. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, hit the like button down below. Share it with your biathlon friends. Either way, the link is down below in the description. Whatever platform you're listening to this on, we are on Google, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So, uh, yeah, check out that link down below. Send us a voice message, and we hope that you all have a happy holiday season. We'll see you after the break. <laughs>